Hey Canucks fans, I am Clay Emo. I'm at Canuck Clay on Twitter. I'm at Clay Emo on Instagram. I'm the founder of the GLCPC, the Good Looking Canucks Positivity Club. And as my Canucks take on one take, it's Clay's Canucks commentary for Wednesday, April the 29th. This is where you get Canucks insight that's both positive and timely. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to continue my Zoom chats. And it's with someone I've admired for more than a decade now, probably a decade and a half. It is TSN's James Duthie. And we chat for about 40 minutes about some fun stuff, about some serious stuff, about some looking ahead, uh, looking back. I, I'm just so excited to present this interview with you. I don't want to spoil too much, but we talk about a lot of the fun segments that they've done, Puck Over Glass, Luongo Schneider, The Hangover in LA. We talk about what Trade Center is like and how crazy that is. We talk about the Canucks and his outlook for the team and what he predicts, you know, how, how quickly they're gonna be a real contender in the NHL. And of course, we talk about his memories from Vancouver, not only the 2010 Olympics, which he played a big part in, but also the, the Stanley Cup series against Boston. And then we also talk about, the one thing I really wanna talk about was his award-winning journalism on Jonathan Petra the young man who passed away two years ago now from a skin disease, a skin disorder. So, so many things to get to. I don't wanna spoil any of it. So enjoy this chat with James Duthie. I'll check in with you on the other side. Okay, friends, I am thrilled. I have the one broadcaster that I'd say I've looked up to ever since I was uh, a little bit younger, still the same good looking. I'm thrilled to welcome to the vlog from TSN, James Duthie. James, thanks for being here today. Oh, Clay, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem. Tell me what you've been up to, given everything that's going on, and how are you holding up? Oh, holding up, fine. I mean, uh, we often say uh, we're very lucky considering what everybody else is going through. I live in a city about, uh, a town really, about a half an hour north of Toronto, and, uh, you know, it's a nice, quiet neighborhood. We have lots of space to walk around and walk our dogs, so we're not suffering at all right now. Um, I mean, besides boredom and the fact that I can't play golf and all those first world problems, uh, yes. uh, every, every, everything's been fine. What I've been up to, hmm. well, we do a lot of segments for TSN. Uh, yeah. We do insider trading a couple of times a week. We do the quiz and I try to do some interviews as often as I can. So I'll do whatever that they throw at me. Yeah. Uh, besides that, I hit golf balls into a net in my backyard and uh, go on long a lot of walks with the dogs, try to work out and hang out with the family, which has been cool, actually. I got a 16-year-old, 18-year-old, a 20-year-old, and to have them all home and, uh, you know, actually wanting to hang out and watch a show or whatever with their dad is uh, pretty cool because I'm sure as soon as this is over, I won't see them again. Oh, I hear you. And it's funny, you have 16, 18, 20. I have 16, 18, 12. So two of our three kids the same age. Right. What's the one thing you're going to do, James, once everything is relatively lifted and restrictions are lifted? What's the one? It sounds like golf might be one of the things you miss the most. What else? Golf's a big one yeah. and travel. Um, yeah. The hockey season is so long generally that we always go on one big sort of family trip in the, uh, in the summertime where uh, we'll go, you know, to, to Europe or Hawaii or somewhere really cool. Uh, try to explore a lot and I think that's that's one thing that uh, we'll miss this summer if we don't get away anywhere I, I think that's kind of our favorite thing to do as a family yeah. um, besides that I'm a kind of like Clay it's been fairly I'm kind of a nomadic homebody anyway so Does that explain the beard or no <laughs> I don't really know how to explain the beard <laughs> except that I just don't care I was on we did a zoom chat today with about uh Pretty much every TSN hockey commentator, and uh, they were all just ripping me, but I don't <laughs> care. I, I, I won't probably wear it on air when I'm back on actual television at some point, but right. hey, it's a pandemic. All rules are off. I, I made the, I think a couple of days in, I said, I'm going to grow this until hockey comes back. Okay. And at that point, I thought, you know, maybe in a couple of months, it'd be back. Not, not, uh, <laughs> So it may, it may be a while. It's like a reverse playoff beard. I don't do it. I don't do it until the playoffs start again. So you might well, get stuck it, with it till next spring if they don't get us finish this yes. thing off. It definitely speaks to your optimism. I was hoping to be back sooner as opposed to later as well. But if I tried to do that, James, literally, I'd have to start my playoff beard for the Canucks for two years from now, basically today. That would take yeah. me. A while. I have like yeah. Sidney Crosby 2006 first round beard. Yeah, wispy. Yeah. Yep, I tried I to you. do like, I started to shave off the sides, even though I know goatees aren't in anymore, just because they were, if you think this is bad, it was really shocked. You know, it was just like really patchy at the sides. So sure your wife and kids like the clean, 
the clean cut look. Yeah, <laughs> nobody, no, they, none of them care. <laughs> so, of course, uh, when I started to share that I was going to be able to chat with you for a few minutes today, um, a lot of people got excited. Uh, they like you just as much as I do. But they, as much as I want to get into all the behind the scenes broadcasting stuff, which I'm very interested in, they do want to know your opinion on this year's Vancouver Canucks. Uh, not just Pedersen and Hughes, but you can talk about them. But overall, uh, how do you think they're trending? And do you think they're trending where they should be trending at this point of everything, their development and management and so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean, I, it's going to be a captain obvious answer, uh, but definitely. I, I, was, I thought they were one of the more exciting teams in the National Hockey League, and I was really looking forward to seeing them in the playoffs. I don't think they were going to go deep although that division was a crapshoot and I guess still is a crapshoot if it happens. And the one thing I will say, if they do pull this off and I'm still very skeptical, but if they somehow pull this thing off and, and have these little regional playoffs or whatever that start in August or September or whatever the heck it is, um, I think it's going to be more of a crapshoot than ever before. The playoffs are always a crapshoot, yep. but I think this scenario with a couple of months off, are, is going to make it a free-for-all. So a young team like the Canucks, hot goalie, uh, who knows what could happen. So, you know, when I say I don't think they're going to go on a run, that's just based basically on my history of following hockey and saying that teams usually when they finally have that breakthrough, if they don't go boom all the way, except for Chicago maybe in 2010 where, you know, Taves and Kane arrived and they sort of had one year and then boom. They were Stanley Cup champions. That happens sometimes. I don't think it's going to happen with Vancouver, but man, I I think this is the start of a really good. I don't like to say we the tendency is to say the next decade is going to look really good. I don't think right. you can say that in hockey anymore because things change so fast. One injury, one one guy doesn't work out, whatever. But I would say the next five years uh, are going to be really really fun to watch. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because when people ask me, I always say about 20, 2024, 2025, you know, when Pedersen's 24, 25 years old and Hughes, that's when you really expect to see them. But uh, I agree with you. Uh, Jacob Marstrom coming back, Tyler Toffoli, we want to get more than our 10 games worth, right? There's a lot of hope here. First world problems, of course, we want the world to be better first, but there is certainly an excitement here for sure. And I, I would oh, yeah. say, Pet and, yeah. And, and there really, and there should be. It was funny. I was watching the uh, parts three and four of the Bulls documentary last night and, yeah. uh, you know, you kind of forgot how the struggling that the, the Jordan went through and those early teams and how they kept getting knocked out by the, the Pistons. Pistons, yeah. Yeah, and the Canucks aren't at that stage yet. You know, you can make comparisons to various teams. The Leafs who've gotten knocked off by Boston and can't get by them. And I think once the Canucks get to the playoffs, you know, maybe they'll have those initial problems where, um, again, though, that division's so different. But just to get to that stage is a huge accomplishment. And then the bigger thing will be, you know, two or three years down the road, if they do make to the playoffs consistently and have a couple of failures breaking through. But I think that happens just so often in sports and the Jordan thing reminded me of it. You have the best player in the world and yeah. uh, you know, a guy who's becoming the second best player in Pippen and they still took a while to get over the hop. So, uh, but anyway, great times. Uh, yeah. I always say my favorite cup final was the, the 2011 cup final. Um, yeah. that, and, you know, we're kind of selfish. We like cup finals based on the cities we go to and the restaurants we go to and such. But I, I'd never had more fun than I had in Vancouver in those couple of weeks in June in 2011. And so I would love to be back in 2024 or 25 or oh, that's awesome. whatever it may be. Yeah, and I'll bounce back to your, your love for Vancouver in a second. That's really cool. But I do want to touch on one of the latest interviews you did. It was with the three Hughes brothers. They're all sitting so politely and so nicely on their couch. Um, were there any bloopers or anything where they actually showed, not that they didn't show personality, but they were just so well-spoken and articulate and reserved, so respectful. Yeah. I saw you trying to needle them. No, come on. Who's the better ping pong player? Yeah. Who's the better? Uh, what was that experience like just overall? They, they seem like very respectful kids. That's They're really I mean. nice guys. I yeah. mean, I, I know a couple of people said they weren't the most exciting ever. It wasn't the most exciting interview I've ever done. But, I mean, that, that's kind of the way with, with, with hockey. And I, I came away thinking, man, those are three nice, really well-raised kids. Yeah. Right? To, to, to handle it that way. That doesn't mean they're the most colorful. And, you know, I don't know them very well. You know, sometimes if you know, uh, I've interviewed Quinn. And Jack, I think a couple of times each, haven't interviewed Luke, but 
Uh, those are uncomfortable situations where you're talking to some clown on the other side of a Zoom screen and you're all three tucked together <laughs> on a couch. So, uh, um, you know, I, d I didn't expect it to be a, a comedy show. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just, just three really nice guys. Yeah. Getting interviewed by a clown on Zoom. I've heard that uh, used about me a couple times too, <laughs> So, but that's okay. Okay. So you talked, uh, we know that you had a huge part in producing and, and running a lot of... Uh, the coverage of the 2010 Winter Olympics. And then you're in Vancouver 18 months later for the Stanley Cup finals. Talk about, you know, I think this would not you know, score brownie points with my viewers, but you, it sounds like you love Vancouver as a city and as a, as a destination. I do. Uh, so, I mean, BC in general, my dad was from Kamloops. Right. And so all his family was from BC. And then we spent uh, three years living in Victoria. My dad was RCMP, so we got transferred all over the country. But I lived in Victoria from age like six to eight, played soccer for the Gordon Head Soccer Club. And I always felt like it was where I was going to live. Uh, that's where I wanted to live my life. And so I worked in Ottawa early on in the business. Uh, and then I actually had an audition for TSN when I was, I guess, 29 or 30. And at the same time, I got a job offer in Vancouver at uh, your, some of your listeners or viewers might uh, remember VTV. Yes. Now, I guess the CTV station there at Robson and Burrard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't get the TSN job and I took the job at VTV, but I was really excited. My wife and I and our dog just packed up my SUV and drove across the country. And I remember telling the boss at TSN at the time, I said, uh, he said, I really want to hire you someday. I just can't give you this job. Mm -hmm. And I said, no problem. Just don't call me for two or three years because I really want to live in Vancouver. I really want to see what it's like out there. And he called me in six months and, uh, and offered me a job with TSN. So I was only in Vancouver for nine or 10 months. And uh, it was that, you know, as, T as much as TSN had always been a dream of mine, it was, uh, I, we were disappointed because we were actually out. My, my wife's parents were then girlfriend's parents were visiting me and we were out, we rented a fishing boat and we were out on English Bay fishing for salmon. Yep. And I literally had a salmon like on my, on my reel when I got the call offering me the job at TSN. And uh, I'm like, I don't, I don't really know if I, I'm really enjoying this right now. I don't know if I want to come. But uh, yeah, so I loved it. And so for 2010 to happen and for me to be fortunate enough to uh, be a part of the, our Olympic coverage was, was a dream come true. I wrote about it in my book and I'll say, uh, you know, as long as my career is on, that will be the highlight of my career is yeah. being a part of that. Uh, just two of the best weeks, hardest working weeks, but two of the best weeks of uh, my entire life for sure. Yeah. Our, I was telling you off air, our office building was right next to BC place at the time. So we were right in the middle of all of the, the, the pageantry and the crowds. And it was a really, really blessed time. And we had a bunch of young adults kind of staffing our hospitality uh, building, which is really, really cool. Is there one right. thing that sticks out more than anything else, James, about that Winter Olympics experience here in Vancouver? I mean, the obvious would be the golden goal uh, yeah. for sure. I remember, um, you know, a couple of things. First of all, the, the, the loser was killed on the first day of the games uh, before the games had officially opened. And Lisa Laflamme was co-hosting uh, with me we would co-host during the day and then I was going down to the rink to do hockey at night as well and uh, I remember when that happened I was so excited about these games and so excited for Vancouver and for Canada and I remember being so devastated uh, not just because this young man had lost his life but thinking that the, the Olympics will never recover from this right it'll just be this is going to ruin the Olympics forever and you realize as it goes on that the Olympics is such a big event as a great a tragedy as that was and still is that it, it's, it somehow overcame it. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was just to me, it, it, the Olympics are funny because as a broadcaster, it's too, you almost, you have to count down. You're so busy and so tired that part of you is saying, I just can't wait for this to be over because I get up at four in the morning every day, and go over so we were at the station at like five and I think we were on the air at eight or something like that and uh, I was going out at night because it was the Olympics and we were in Canada and so I was just so exhausted I was getting two hours of sleep a night um, so you want it to be over but then you, you don't want it to be over when it ends um, the other thing I remember is uh, I co-hosted the closing ceremonies with Lisa and we went to a, uh, a rehearsal on the Saturday night and I remember thinking it was so hokey 
don't know if you remember, but it had like giant inflatable beavers. Oh yeah, and, I remember. <laughs> and it was really, it was an Australian guy who directed the thing. And I remember thinking, this is, if we lose uh, the gold medal game in hockey, if Canada loses, everybody will be so pissed off that this, they will hate this closing ceremony. Like it will just be a disaster. But because Canada won, and I think everybody was drunk, it, yeah. it was actually pretty good. It was kind of charming and homey, and we all laughed at it because we were all in such a great mood. So those are the things that yeah. stick out in my mind. That is a great point, James, because I remember the game was at noon local time, and the closing ceremony basically started at 4 or 4.30 or 5, right after right. the game on a right. Sunday afternoon. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good oh, memory. The, the one other thing I think I wrote in my book was uh, – so that was a crazy day. I went in, we hosted from the studio. Then I, I ran, I couldn't get a cab. So I think I, I basically jogged from uh, our site, which was on the water where the convention center is, and down to the rink to do the pregame for the gold medal game. Crosby scores, we do the post game. I run over to BC Place to do the closing ceremonies. And then Lisa and I have a car waiting for us outside wherever you had to walk to. I can't remember the straight now. My Vancouver yeah. geography's gone. And it was one of the volunteers driving the car. And she, we get in the car, and I remember just taking this big, big deep breath, like, wow. Like, that was one of the most incredible days of my life. And a, a pedestrian runs across, and we smack a pedestrian at the intersection. And the poor girl who was driving, this young volunteer, was freaking out. And I thought we killed this guy. And there was paramedics there in like 30 seconds. They were already at the corner. And the guy was down for about 10 minutes. And this poor girl was crying. And we were trying to comfort her, telling her it wasn't her fault. And then the guy just kind of got up. He was, he, I guess he was just hammered. And he got up. And the paramedics are trying to stop him. And he kind of runs by our window and says, he had an Irish accent. That's all I remember. And he's like, sorry, my fault. My bad. And he runs away. This paramedic is chasing him down the street saying you need attention. So just it was very weird, weird ending to the Olympic Games. Wow, wow, that's, uh, how hard did she hit him, if I may, in the car? Yeah, well, really hard, I mean, well, really hard. It felt really hard. He went, like, diving over the hood like it was some cop show, right? It was T.J. Hooker, and he was flying and down, and, but, uh, wow, yeah, it was, a, but I was really glad that we didn't kill anybody on the last night of the Olympics. <laughs> I'll, uh, let's skip ahead to the Vancouver uh, Game 7, that, that, that whole thing. Yeah. Without rehashing the whole thing, how, um, how long did you stay in town after, after that game seven? Uh, Do you remember? I think we were gone the next day. Yeah. I think we probably had first flight out. Um, there's another funny story. Uh, yeah. The, uh, that day, so I'm very professional most of the time. And, you know, if, if it's a night before a game, we don't go out. I might go have dinner and then go, you know, right to, to, to bed or hang out in my hotel room and watch a movie or whatever. But for whatever reason, the night before game seven, I, I had an old friend I hadn't seen for a while, decided to go for a drink. And I, rem I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but it was like something ridiculous, like mango mojitos. And they were like three for one. And so we started drinking these mojitos and I, 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 just, I just lost and I was, I was gonzoed. And so, and the next day we were at a, ended up at a bar with all these crazy Bruin fans and I walked in at three. So like first time in my career, night before work, I was completely hung over the next day for game seven. And then Ray Ferraro, uh, as we were doing our, our hits on false Creek, walked into the glass and cut his nose open. Yes. They've and so, stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The entire, so the entire game, I was like, had my hands between my legs, like just looking up, trying to watch the play once in a while, just praying it didn't go to overtime because I had the shakes. And Ray had this blood and ooze coming from his nose. And so we're doing the post game after the Canucks had lost down in the bowels of the building. And here's me <laughs> trying to hold the microphone steady. Ray's got his nose is all wrecked. And Bob McKenzie just going, what a mess you guys are. That so is, it, was, it wasn't the best night. That's unreal. People were worried about what was happening outside. They should be worried about you guys inside. Well, so we, we were worried about that certainly as well. So uh, that, was, that was a crazy night. Oh, no, thanks for those stories. Okay, let's talk uh, about some of your the segments that you do on TSN. I, I believe you won an award for some of your Trade Center coverage. Is that fair to say? You, you don't have to be humble. Like, did you, you won an award? <laughs> Somewhere along the way, yeah. uh, for whatever yeah. awards are worth. Yes. So uh, Trade yeah. Center, I'm always, I'm always oh, as a hockey fan, of course, but as, a, as someone who enjoys media and, and likes to 
take a peek behind the curtain, so to speak. I know that you're on that, major, that main panel with three or four other guys. Then you got a panel on your left shoulder. You got a panel on your right shoulder. You got computers, producers, cameras. How crazy is it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an insane day. Um, I th I think that I've gotten used to it. I, it's kind of slowed down over the years. Not yeah. not just in quality of trades, but I just mean. <laughs> I think in my early years, maybe it just felt like complete and utter mayhem. But yeah. uh, now that we've been doing it for so long, it feels normal to us. Yeah. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, so it's it's funny. In my early years of Trade Center, I used to prepare like crazy, like I was preparing for exams, where I would study and contemplate every possible deal and who might be going where and what every team's need was. And then I kind of stopped doing it because I just realized it was just stupid and it was <laughs> unpredictable. So now I don't prepare at all. And we just kind of wing the whole thing, but uh, it, it's become, it's never been my most enjoyable day because I, I still frankly believe that it's too long and that we should be on at noon or something instead of 8 a.m. Right. But I have realized every time I, I used to complain to the bosses and say, why don't we shorten this thing down? And they show me the ratings and people watch for some reason. Yeah. I always think it's kind of like rubberneckers at an accident scene. People just want to see how we fill the time and what goes wrong and all the stupid stuff we do. So uh, uh, I've come to s s sort of embrace it. I, yeah. I loved it and then I hated it for a few years. Right. And now I don't mind it again because in the end, you're just hanging out with 20 guys who love hockey. And uh, sure. um, yeah, so I, I, I really enjoy that part of it. So and, uh, Bob McKenzie and Darren Drager, are they sitting there trying to break things first? Or are they pretty cool about, you know, i I'll I'll help you out. You take this one. I'll do this one. Because it's funny. They're all on their phones on air. You wouldn't see that usually before you try to be more conspicuous. But now they're tweeting right, right when they're, the camera's on them. Well, I'll give you one trade secret. <laughs> sure. Here. I think what they do a lot of the time is that uh, one guy will find a trade and let the other guy report it. Because, you know, they're worried about their various sources, you know, uh, being exposed as to well Drake's always talks to this guy so he must have got it from this guy or you know if a gm knows that bob always talks to his assistant gm and then bob breaks the deal involving that team well that guy must have given it to them right. so I, I i think they don't really reveal a lot of secrets but i think a lot of the time what happens is if bob has a deal he gives it to Drake's, and Drake's is the one who reports it and if pierre has a deal and it goes on so on and so forth like that but yeah. uh there i don't think uh, Clay breaking the news has been uh, that important anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's usually broken by Twitter accounts five seconds before somebody else. So I think getting it right is probably more important than, than anything else. Okay, I, as a parody song creator, I love some of the stuff you've been doing, either music parodies or movie parodies. The, two I, the three I want to ask you about really quickly is Puck Over Glass, the LA Kings Hangover, and the Luongo Schneider bit. So really quickly, Puck Over Glass, that was brilliant. Uh, the church choir <laughs> coming in at the end. Who actually wrote the lyrics to that song, if you remember? That was really good. Yeah, so uh, it'll be a humble brag. That, th those are probably the things, it's crazy. I don't, I don't know if I'll look back on my career and that's what I'll be known for. I guess that's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I probably take pride in those things as much as anything else we've done. Because it's not like when your career is done, you look back and you go, well, that was a really good panel we did that one time. Uh, during the Canucks game, right? Um, so uh, I was, my dad was a musician mm. and uh, uh, a really good musician. And I never got, I could never learn to really play an instrument or anything like that. But I always was musical in the sense that I, I used to write songs from the time I was 12 years old and I was in some crappy garage band that wasn't really a garage band. We never went anywhere, but, but I would write songs and we'd, and we'd perform them. But I could not write music per se. So I'd write like, a tune in my head and write lyrics or whatever and so I always wanted to, I'm lucky enough to have a guy at the station Lester McLean who's appeared in a bunch of things yes. and usually is the guy singing the songs like he is in Puck Over Glass yeah and uh, so we have this sort of collaborative method where uh, it started I don't know what the first story I did some goofy story many years ago about the origins of the trap which nobody remembers probably because it's pre-YouTube mm. and it was me going on a quest to Europe I actually went to Europe to find the guy who invented the trap and really stupid story. And I wrote a song in the middle of the piece that aired kind of like a video montage in the middle of the story and Lester <laughs> recorded it for me. So 
we used to do these things during the playoffs. We used to do these billboards. Uh, one year it was puck over glass. One year it was, you know, too many men. Whenever there was a penalty or a trend during the playoffs, we would run this billboard in the background. And the big screen, yeah. That tote board, excuse me. Yeah. So that year it was puck over glass was crazy and we kept doing the tote board and I was starting to try to think of something original and literally on a night home from work, uh, this tune came into my head and I, I, I got home from work and grabbed like a piece of paper towel and wrote the lyrics in about five minutes and uh, sent, sent, all I would do is I take my phone and I still do this when I do stuff with Lester and I just take my voice memo folder and, and sing the, the tune into the voice memo folder and I said put this to music and he's a brilliant musician and puts it to music and and so uh yeah that one I that one I loved because it was just so stupid he had yeah. Bob McKenzie blowing on the <laughs> the shell at the end and uh Vic you know we got we got this gospel a full gospel choir in my favorite part it was so good and decided to have Vic Router for no reason whatsoever being the guy who was singing the gospel choir so uh that was that was really fun. Uh, what was the second thing? You asked it was about? just it was outstanding, and uh, it's funny that you mentioned it only took you five minutes to write. Sometimes, and maybe they show in our lyrics. Sometimes, those ideas when they hit, they hit hard, and it's not like right. we're spending three hours writing. It's it's a five to fifteen minute exercise. Right? Yeah, you're, you're the, I know you're the same way with those things. I yeah. wrote another one. We did one a couple of years ago called "Don't Take My Goal Away," yeah. <laughs> which, was, which was the same thing. It was about all the long delays they had in video review, and we kind of did a boy band theme there. Yes. And uh, I hate to say this, my bosses, I probably spend more time on these things than anything else I do at work. Like, like we literally spent a night choreographing like a, a boys, uh, a Backstreet Boys type thing with wearing white suits with Jeff yeah. O'Neill and Jamie McLennan. It was so stupid. Beautiful. We had Tino Retta and Bob yeah. McKinney rapping. So yeah, those things are just, uh, they're so stupid, but I have always loved, I grew up on David Letterman mm -hmm. and uh, I just love stupid, stupid humor. And, and to a point where if only like 20% of people really like it and 80% don't get it, I'm, I'm usually happier that way yeah. because, you know, I, as long as it's funny to me or the, my friends. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, puck over glass is probably the one that I, people, whenever there's a penalty in the playoffs or whatever, people tweet at me and such. So uh, love it. I made it. that a single somehow. <laughs> Absolutely. Second one was the LA Kings hangover. Yeah. Another one of my favorites. So that one was very simple. Um, one of our staff members happened to look like Zach Galifianakis. You just read my Rick. mind. Yeah, and Rick actually passed away quite suddenly a couple oh. of years ago, which is really sad. But he looked exactly like Zach Galifianakis. And so one of our producers said one day, why don't you guys do a, like a parody of The Hangover? Uh, and the Kings had just won the Stanley Cup. And the next thing you know, Dregs and I were flying to L.A. to do this parody hangover. And the only thing that was bothering me was I didn't have an ending. Like I had the whole story played out in my head. And by the way, like making a movie has got to be really hard because I had to do a plot like for a four minute video and, and make sure this thing somehow worked together. And that was hard enough. Yeah. Um, but Daryl Sutter, I was trying to decide who was going to be the guy who drugged us at the end and went through a whole different bunch of different scenarios and ended on Daryl Sutter. And I, I wrote the Kings and asked if he would maybe do this and, I thought we had no chance in hell. Yeah, they came back in five minutes and said, "Yeah, Daryl's going to do it." And I, I couldn't believe it. So that just, was, uh, oh, that, was just, that was awesome. Just the way he deadpanned it, and of course, Vancouver connection. That's because you guys chose the Canucks. That was really, really good. By the way, the funny story on that one is I had the uh, Ed Helms. Uh, uh, that's another reason we did that. We kind of meshed the characters around because everybody says I look like Ed Helms, but right. Um, I had the, the Mike Tyson tattoo that Ed Helms has in the second Hangover movie. And we went out, when we finally shot, we shot all day in LA and uh, went out for dinner at this restaurant called The Strand in Manhattan Beach. And really nice kind of posh restaurant. We were celebrating this all day shoot. And I still had the tattoo on my face. And I'm wearing like a preppy, you know, Lacosta shirt or something in this really nice restaurant. All these old couples are eating dinner and everyone's looking at me and I can't figure out why because I'd forgotten and all the crew had been used to it. So I went to the washroom at one point and I look in the mirror. I'm like, oh God, I have this Mike Tyson tattoo on the side of my face. Oh, uh, and the clubbing scenes, uh, were those legit? Like, you, did you go to a yes, nightclub? we went into the <laughs> club and we, uh, we were not allowed to film in this club. And so it was complete guerrilla filmmaking. Yes. We were just using our phones and we knew we were going to get these, all these big bouncers chasing us around the dance floor. So we were in this club for like five minutes. We were completely sober yeah. and... Everybody thought we were just hammered, but 
we shot all that in like, I don't know, two hours or something. It was oh. just, it was lunacy. So good. And the third one I want to ask you about is, uh, it's going to resonate with Canucks fans for sure. All those Luongo Schneider bits. Um, great stuff. Yeah, so, uh, you know. <sighs> you might have to do a Markstrom Demko one next year, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it started, uh, we have a, a guy I work for who is our managing editor of hockey. He's a very serious guy, Steve Dryden, who's actually the evil quiz master. Really smart <laughs> guy who, who comes up with a lot of features, but he's very serious minded. So he came to me once and said, I want to do a story about what it's like to be a backup goaltender. And he said, why don't you do Jamie McLennan, who was at the time uh, Luongo's backup in Florida. And Jamie had been, I guess, inquiring about a career in broadcasting. And so I said, I don't want to do a story on a backup goalie. That's just boring as hell. And so my, I don't know, my warped mind started thinking about it. And I had a producer named Jeremy McElhaney, who was a good buddy of mine and uh, equally warped. And uh, we came up with this idea of doing how the backup goalie was kind of a servant of the goalie, but he, he secretly wanted to kill him so he could be the goalie. It was an incredibly dumb piece. But I had never met Louie before then. You know, I might have been in a few scrums with him, but I didn't know him. But I got to know him through that piece because he really had no idea. I showed up one day. We had like two hours to shoot. I said, hey, I'm James Duffy from TSN. We're going to run you over with a Zamboni right now. He's like, yeah, I'm up for it. And so I got to be friends with Roberto because of that. And he called me, uh, I think we did another one about poetry. I don't know if you've ever seen yep. that. One. You can look it up where oh, yeah. I believe mean, he was a poet. And again, I flew out and wrote all the poems on the plane and, uh, and Louis performed brilliantly. And so we'd done a couple of these pieces before. And then Louis wrote me one day and said, you, we should do something. There was so much controversy about Luongo and Schneider back in those days. And he said, you should do a story about us, like, you know, hating each other, fighting for this number one job. And so that's what we did. And I just love the fact that he was into it. And Corey was unbelievable. Corey's a fantastic guy. He was coming up with bits and they were both coming up with bits. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, again, those ones are so dumb. I think my favorite Luongo one is probably the panel intern, which was the last one we ever did or he was an intern uh, working with the panel. Yeah. But the Snyder Luongo one is, is right behind it. And, uh, he's, uh, yeah, he was game for anything, which made him pretty much my favorite player. That's such a cool story. And uh, the, the fact that Luongo was the one who pitched it to you after working with you in, the, in Florida with McLennan. Yeah. And the other thing about those things, like the crazy thing about, you know, when they do a video or something or some, uh, in Hollywood or a rock video, whatever, they take four days to shoot it or... Yeah. Uh, we have we all of these things were all shot in like 45 minutes. The Luongo Schneider one, you know, they're on an off day. I think in Columbus we flew in, and we had basically, you know, 35 minutes after practice with them. So you were just like shoot, 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 one take, one take, one take. You take what you have and you just go. And uh, so it's like I said, it's very intense kind of uh, silly filmmaking. But uh, again, some of my favorite stuff we've done at TSN. Unreal, 45 minutes to film the ice, to film the dressing room, to drill, uh, film the concourse. That's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Cool, one more I wanna ask you about, James, uh, before we wrap up, is um, a more serious one. And it's of course the story, the very touching story of Jonathan Petra, passed away two years ago now. Um, I can't say, maybe you could say, I know the initials are EB of the, the skin disorder he had, but now that it's two years later, we recognize you know, the wonderful storytelling that you did, the butterfly, uh, effect of the butterfly so it's called the butterfly, oh, butterfly child yeah butterfly child um now that it's been two months uh, two years later what when you look back aside from the the, the friendship that you developed and and mm -hmm. with the family what stands out to you now now that you've had two years to um yeah to not move on we always remember him yeah. you always no, will, that's, but, that's, yeah. a, that's a great that's a great question clay uh i just think it's it's the incredible strength of, of this kid and that's the one thing. I, I guess I have two favorite things in my job. And, and one of them is doing those stupid things that we were just talking about and being able to be creative. And uh, I was always kind of an idiot. I had idiot friends who were all funnier than me as a teenager. And to be able to do some of the same sort of skits we did together and actually put them on television, um, that's one of my favorite things. And, and the second is be, be one of the real benefits of the position you are in is that you are able to meet guys like Jonathan, um, who I would maybe have never met in a normal walk of life, but because 
he wrote there, they wrote an article about him in Ottawa and said he wanted to be a sportscaster. And so we were able to reach out and have him down at TSN and we formed this, this friendship and this, um, you know, I recommend for any of your viewers who haven't seen it, watch either our documentary or any of the documentaries. They're hard to watch, but they're incredibly inspiring on Jonathan, the butterfly child. ESPN did a great one as well. Um, but it's basically a skin disease that covers every inch of your body. And from the moment you're born, you're in pain every single day of your life, like excruciating pain. And to see this kid, the way he handled it, to be so upbeat and so positive all the time. And then you think of the little stuff that we whine about every day, right? And so I, I know perspective is kind of an overused term about things like this. So this puts things in perspective, but it really does for you about how little your problems are. We're still going to complain. I'm still like any other person. I'll still, you know, bitch about stupid things that I shouldn't <laughs> bitch about sometimes. But in the grand scheme, that kid taught me more about uh, life and how to approach life than anyone I've ever met in my life. Like he just a complete and utter uh, inspiration, just an, an amazing, amazing kid. So that that's what sticks with me is just how lucky I was to get to meet him and, you know, share in his life for, for three years. Well, well said. And do you know, how's the family doing right now? Do you know? Uh, they're doing okay. I mean, Tina, his mom, who was uh, equally heroic uh, because she basically had to give every day of her life to Jonathan. And, uh, you know, they were best friends as well as mother and son. And she also had to move away from her daughter, uh, you know, who was going to school in Ottawa and moved to Minnesota to, where he had to try these two transplants, which ultimately failed. So she had to give up a big chunk of her life. Um, and then to lose Jonathan, who she's devoted her entire life to, you know, to lose a child anyway is uh, unfathomable, but to lose a child in those circumstances is crazy. So she's had a really tough couple of years. I think she's doing as well as expected. You know, she's obviously back with her daughter and, uh, and, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, she's doing okay, but are you ever going to be really be okay? I, I just can't even imagine going through something like that. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end James, especially, uh, yeah, I, I thank you for that, especially the the whole notion about perspective and you being a father just like I am, you, just to see Tina's dedication every single day. Jonathan was her life for, for those uh, few years. And, uh, yeah, it really was, really was. Very inspiring. No, um, thank you. I really appreciate the time, uh, the, the lighter stories, the more serious stories, and, and simply your insight, your love for Vancouver, and your optimism for our Canucks. I think all things that will resonate with that people that will end up seeing this. So, James, thanks again for your time. Oh, no, buddy. Thank you very much for having me on. You keep doing those parodies, okay? I've, uh, I've <laughs> we'll slowed to, down, so people yeah, we'll like do you a, are way more prolific, and I love them, so uh, keep those up for me, all right? All right. I'll get my people to talk to your people. We'll collab one day. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Clay. So I hope you enjoyed that chat. James is an amazing storyteller, as you can tell. He had me laughing. He had me also uh, reflecting when we ended off speaking about Jonathan Petra. Uh, that I, that's how I wanted to end off the interview and there's just so much there and I, I was so grateful that James said yes right away when I reached out to him to appear with me here. So Canucks fans, let me know. Leave a comment. Let me know what stu stood out to you from that interview. Was it one of his answers? Was it one of his stories? Was it, was it his time in Vancouver? Was it what he thinks about the Canucks? Was it Jonathan Petra? Was it uh, some of the Trade Center um, work? Was it some of the, the fun segments they do on TSN? Was it his love for Vancouver? Whatever it is, I'd love to know your reactions to this chat. Leave a comment below. I would, I will read, react, and reply as always. And once again, so grateful to James for his time and his energy today. Quick programming note, it is Wednesday, so that means I will jump on a YouTube at 10 o'clock for my semi-weekly live stream twice a week. We can talk about this, we can talk about the Canucks, we can talk about the NHL, we'll talk about whatever you want to, uh, chance to check in with each other. So again, tonight, 10 p.m. Pacific time, join me for my, my weekly Canucks live stream on YouTube. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, be safe, be healthy. Have a great day, God bless, and go Canucks go.